today we're going to talk about uh, refinement in Phoenix. And I'll touch on validation as well, although I realize Jane will be talking about it, but I guess what I will mention is complementary to what Jane is going to talk about, not overlapping. Great. Um, so that's the plan. That's the plan for today. Um, going to start with just talking about general um, general introduction to refinements in case of crime so that we all on the same page then i'll proceed to uh, particular considerations and tips that might be useful for you guys to do refinement and that i gathered over years from questions coming to mailing lists and then if i have time i hope i will uh we'll run some live uh, demonstrations Good. Um, that's just an acknowledgments. And just, just so you know, everything I'll be talking about is not just made by me or one person. Uh, it's a team effort. It's a collaboration. A lot of people involved across the, across the globe. So Austin Berkeley, Tom Los Alamos, and others. So that's, that's the big team working on uh, what I'll be talking about. Um, there's a recent publication, well, recent, a couple of years uh, old now, uh, that uh, documents Phoenix. And I strongly encourage you guys to check it if you haven't done it yet so. Um, I'm pretty sure you saw this slide from Tom or Paul. Um, that's basically outlines we have all the tools in Phoenix to um, do structure solution for CryM. Once your starting point is uh, 3D reconstruction, the map that you got from a uh, software like Reliant or Sparks or whatever you use. So you go all the way um, through the procedure that Tom outlined and Paul and others. Um, and what we focus on today is refinement validation. These are next to final stages of in this procedure, which lead to the structure that you are ready to analyze for your biology questions, as well as you know, ready to, to publish it. So that's what we focus on today. Yeah, I'll start with baby steps and slowly, um, just so again, we're all on the same page. So just by defining what structure refinement is, because I really realized that not everyone uh, knows what it is. <laughs> so um, really refinement is a procedure where you start out with a map and model placed approximately into the map, close enough to the map actually. And that procedure called refinement fits the model into the map as good as possible. That's very not sure what refinement is about. For CryM and crystallography as well, actually. Now, there's a great deal of confusion going on when it comes to fitting the model into the map. So I put in the slide just to try to alleviate this confusion. Um, so there are different scenarios. Uh, showing different situations where you want to fit, when you want to fit the model into the map. So for example, it may happen that your map and model don't fit at all. You have your map and model derived from homology structures, you know, X-ray structure maybe, and map and model don't overlay at all. So then docking is the procedure that places your model into the map, right? So there's another scenario where you have um, map and model that fit okay, but there are places in the model that are very, very far away from being a good fit to the map. So refinement is not going to help you here. And for this, there are tools called flexible fitting or morphing 
that can achieve large motions so that your model fits the map, right? And if I'm, as I said, is a situation when you have your model that fits the map pretty well, and you really need to improve that fit. So that's the requirement and that's the focus for, for our conversation today. Now, just to say we have in Phoenix, we have two tools to do refinement for crystallography and cryom. Uh, for crystallography, we have Phoenix Refine. That's the name of the tool that does refinement. In case of crystallography, we have analogous tool uh, that does the same job, but given different data, cryom data. And as you can see here, they are very, they are very similar actually in terms of procedure. So they all start with initial model. In case of crystallography, it's a crystal structure. In case of cryom, it's just a model sitting in your volume, P1 unit cell. You start with experimental data, crystallography, that's your intensities, so amplitudes, diffraction data. Cryom, that's your three-dimensional reconstruction. You also need some more information to help refinement so it actually works. We will talk about it later. And the rest is the same. So given the model and data, you can calculate the score. So the score is a measure that quantifies how well your model fits the data. Then you can try to improve them, change the model, you can try to change the model, so that score improves. You do it cyclically in both cases, and you hope that the, in the end you get improved model. That's, that's the whole refinement idea in a nutshell. And that's exactly the same across crystallography and cryon. Okay. So just to tell you guys, um, both tools are available in the command line. So you can type things in the command line and you can run them from the GUI. We're not going to see how to do it from the command line, but I will, I hope we'll have time to run a live demonstration and see how that works in the GUI. Uh, just to mention, um, Really, I don't have much time to talk about um, details of how real space refinement works at low level, like what exactly happens and such. But there's a paper that we published about two years ago or so uh, that really describes all the, all the nuances of Phoenix real space refinement. But what, what's important to realize that uh, at no point in the procedure we use Fourier space, there's no structure factors involved, there's no R factors, and all in all, the model is refined directly into the map. So that's that, that's the important thing to realize about real space refinement in Phoenix. Now, uh, of course, you probably heard about different approaches, for example, the one that is used in RefMAC, I think, but I'm not sure, which is called legacy procedure, because that's really uh, what happened when there was no dedicated software to do refinement against cryon data. And that is, so you know, basically um, taking cryon map and fully transforming it into, um, into structure factors, into Fourier map coefficients, which you can you know, think of as f ops your diffraction data and, and phases. And then once you have that, you can just use standard reciprocal space refinement procedures and software to, to do the refinement. So that's fine, but there's a number of questions that you should, should ask yourself. And I put some here down below, but that's not the complete list by no means. Um, so well, one is, is conversion map 
con converting map to structure factors lossless? Um, well, the answer is most of the time, yes, but not always. So sometimes you can lose information converting structure factors, converting map to structure factors. Now, you know, standard crystallographic tools um, correct for bulk solvent and, and isotropy and diffraction data. Are these approaches still valid for, for cryo-M data? That's a question. And I don't know if that's yes or no. Now you'll be getting R factors, R work and R free. What is R free in cryo-M? We don't know. Then the software will output you two or false minus F calc maps. And those maps are really relevant to cryo-M. So that's really not what you want to get. And of course, you need to care about form factors because you want to use electron form factors. Okay, well, that's just a point to think about if you take that route. Um, just to mention you perks about real space refinement versus uh, reciprocal space refinement. Well, when you do real space refinement, calculations are faster. Why is because Refinement targets are local, and so they can be paralleled. So all the calculations can done be in parallel, and that's great. So you can split your volume into uh, boxes and do calculations in boxes. And that's why calculations are faster, and so you can handle large models, and that's helpful because you don't want to wait days for refinement to finish if you change just one residue in your structure. And other details like weights between uh, map and restraints can be optimized locally, and they can potentially vary across the volume, which is not possible in case of reciprocal space refinement. So the list is longer, but that's most important, in my opinion, perks of real space refinement. Uh, so I apologize for a lot of text here in this slide, but I wanted to go, I wanted to show you um, the, the conceptual differences between crystallographic refinement and cryo-EM refinement. Just you know, show it side by side. Um, well, let's start with crystallographic refinement. So, just a collection of facts, not necessarily in a logic order. So, when you do crystallographic refinement, improving the model improves the map, right? So, because model contributes to the map by providing phases. So the better model you get, the better map you get, and the better map you get, you can build more model, right? Um, so that also means that you need to refine all model parameters from the very start of refinement all the way to the end of, start of, of your refinement. It also means you need to build solvent as early as you can because by completing your structure, you make your model better, and that makes your map better. And that in turn lets you to allows you to create a better model. In crystallography, your experimental data never changes, right? So we never touch how I also F ops as the taboo, right? We never touch that unless you do star analyzer or something creepy. So data to restraints weight is global, so it's just one value for the whole structure. It can't vary uh, locally. And that means also the whole model needs to be refined at the same time. So pretty much all the points that I mentioned for, cry for crystallographic refinement are different for cryo refinement. So in case of cryo Changing the model does not change the map, right? Because your map is static, no matter what you do to the model, the model does not feed back to the map. What that means 
that means you can build solvent as the very last step in your procedure. Also, that means you can define occupancies and defactors as all, also as the last step in your procedure. So just place your model, get it as complete as possible, and then start worrying about arch logs, occupancies, and defactors. Very much different from crystallography. Unlike crystallography in cryo-EM, experimental data changes a lot, or can, this can potentially change a lot during the process because you might use original map, you might use um, filtered, you know, sharpened or blurred maps, you may extract boxes, you may imply symmetry or not. So there are a lot of options you can do to your map during the process. So technically, um, experimental data, in case of Priam, is a moving target in this sense. And that leads to open questions. Uh, so what map to use in refinement? And what's the meaning of refined B factors? For example, if you refine B factors against sharpened map, you probably get a negative value, so zeros, which is meaningful, meaningless, right? So there's a number of questions to, to, to think of in this case. And the data to restraints can be local because you can do things uh, in volumes. You can split map in, into boxes and do things locally. And that makes you know crime refinement very much different from crystallographic refinement in this sense. There are more points to think about, but these are something that I could come up with and think it's kind of uh, major points here. Now, um, this is a technical nuance uh, that those who don't care can skip, and I'll just mention for the sake of completeness. So the classic real space refinement as it was introduced by Bob Diamond back in the 70s is something like optimizing the least squares target function where you fit uh, your model density, the, the density calculated from, from the model to the observed density, which is your, for example, your cry M map, all the same in terms of cross correlation, which are very related. So this is quite accurate. It works very well, but this is very, very slow to calculate. In fact, prohibitively slow in case of cry M because every time you change your model, you need to calculate model map. And that's very expensive to calculate, time expensive to calculate. And that's the reason we don't use this approach in uh, Phoenix Real Space Refine. What we do use in Phoenix Real Space Refine is a simplified approximation where you just, where your refinement target is just a negated sum of atomic, of, of densities interpolated atomic centers. I hope it's obvious that this way to do it less accurate because uh, this target function does not take into account atomic shapes. For example, it can be different due to resolutions or B factors. And in turn, this uh, leads to, um, to refinement that depends on geometry restraints very much. I'll talk about it later a little bit. But the main benefit of doing this, that this is very fast. That could be several orders of magnitude faster than the classic uh, real space refinement. And so again, that's what we use in uh, Phoenix real space refinement. And again, that's why we heavily rely on geometry restraints in refinement. I'll come back to this a bit later. Um, just, just to explain why is this. So again, very technical nuance, but for those who are interested, I will do explain it. Um, so why is that accurate? So the target like this, the atom-centered target, what, what, what it tries to do, let's consider a high resolution scenario and just two atoms and red is our map with two peaks. So atom one is situated here, atom two is situated here, 
the R2 peaks. So the aim of refinement in this case would be just to move these atoms into these peaks, right? So that's what this target is going to do. Great. In crying case, we don't have, or we very rarely have that high resolution situation, that high resolution data. So we mostly deal with non-atomic resolution, medium resolution, low resolution. And at these resolutions, you don't really see these two peaks for two atoms. Peaks are mostly, you know, uh, blurred and merged into something like this. So in this case, your refinement target is still going to move these two atoms towards the peak center, towards the peak, which is not what you want because that's going to generate a clash. So all in all, the target we use is not accurate in this sense. And you know, the message to take is moving atoms to nearest peaks is does not make an incorrect model. Again, that's exactly why we rely on restraints. But this target still um, optimizes your model against the map as good as possible. A lot of games, but then... Okay, so um, just moving forward, that's the that's the refinement protocol. Overall, overall picture of it, that's what happens when you run real space refinement. So the whole thing starts out with map, and map can be um, you know real space map in MRC or CTP4 format. Or it can be just Fourier map coefficients in MPZ format. We start out with the model, which is a PDB file or can be MMC file. I'll tell more about MMC a bit later. And there's a number of steps that's going on as part of refinement procedure. So um, by the end, you get the fine model again. It can be PDB format or MMC, log file and trajectory. Not all steps actually happen by default. When just run it from without change any parameters, that's what I mean by default. So here are the steps that are actually going to happen if you don't change any parameters when you're on refinement. So what the farm is going to do, load your inputs, then go through refinement map recycle, which is a cyclic procedure doing the same steps over and over by default five times. So it's going to fit rotomers for you. So what that means is it's going to check each and every residue in a structure against the map and against the library of geometric criteria and decide whether that rotomer fits the map well enough and whether it's it is or it is not a rotomer outlier. And if procedure decides that the rot that the side chain does not fit them up well enough, or it's a rotomer outlier, it is going to um, refit that side chain. It's going to, by default again, goes going to calculate optimal weight between uh, the map and restraints. It's going to refine coordinates, which I refer here to as a minimization. It's going to refine B factors, by default individual isotropic B factors, and that's that's new as of two weeks, I guess. And it's also going to refine occupancies, which is also new as of two weeks now. Um, and occupancy refinement, I should say, follows the same procedures, same logic, same protocol as it is in uh, reciprocal space refinement. If you have more questions, I can expand on that. I don't have time to go into deep, great details telling how that is exactly working. And by the way, the trajectory, what I mean by trajectory is a multi-model PDB file that has all the snapshots, intermediate snapshots of the model as it progresses through refinement. That's not out by default, but you can request it. Um, morphing and simulate annealing don't happen by default because probably that's not the most common situation to have to begin with refinement. But just to tell you what it is, is basically addressing a situation when you have, have a map 
and a model that don't fit very well. And the hope is that a certain motion can move your model into the map. And that's the that's 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 the situation where morphing or similar dynamic can help a lot improving your map, model to map fit. So it's not enabled by default, but if you recognize that's your situation, you can enable it and see if that helps you. Okay, now restraints. Uh, I mentioned at some point that um, to run refinement, you need to input model and data and need some more information. So the some more information are in fact, what we refer to as restraints. And, and I'll try to explain what it is in a few slides. So basically, um, if we consider this situation, uh, you know, this is two examples of a phenylalanine um, side chain ring at one, two, three angstrom resolution. The, the corresponding maps obviously look differently. Right, and at, at one angstrom, which is very high resolution, right? It's very high resolution even for X ray. So the map tells exactly where atoms need to be. So the map is pretty much sufficient to define atomic positions. At lower resolutions, the resolutions we deal with most of the time, um, map is enough to tell you where the side chain is but it doesn't tell you where the atoms are so in this map your atoms can be anywhere in this in this torus or in this blob so but placing atoms anywhere on this blob wouldn't be the right thing because that will violate your assumption about uh, stereochemistry of the model so how you make sure that you place your side chain in this map that fits the density correctly, but yet it still makes chemical sense. So to ensure that you need to imply restraints. So some extra knowledge about your chemist, about the chemistry of your structure, such as bond lengths and angles and the fact that the ring is planar. And that information again is included as uh, an extra term in the Feynman target called restraints, which is added with some weight, which depends on how strongly you want to enforce that information in refinement. And those restraints have a lot of um, different terms, again, about defining the bond lengths and angles and torsions and planes and, and, and so on. So that refers to. Um, Covalent geometry. Now, as you go towards lower resolution, four, five, and lower, we are fine with covalent geometry as I just described. But um, what about geometry of a higher level structural organization such as secondary structure? So in High resolution map, you can still see hydrogen bond patterns of of your helices, for example. While you know sausages of density of four or five angstrom resolution just tells you where the helix is, but there's no way you can see a pattern that defines um, that defines hydrogen bonds. So that means map doesn't have information to uh, maintain your prior knowledge about the structure. And why it's important in refinement? Well, I have this toy example that I keep showing to every, every time I give this talk, uh, which is, I find um, very illustrative. So basically, uh, Here's the situation. We have very low resolution map. I think it's four or five angstrom resolution map. It's again a toy example. And we have a perfect helix that fits this map. Now, if we try to refine this helix again, this map without 
actually knowing this is a helix and there are hydrogen bonds between appropriate atoms, then this is what is going to happen. So the atoms are going to move around to pick them up as good as they can, but the geometry of the helix is going to be distorted. Why? Is because um, there's no information that we brought into refinement to tell refinement that this is a alpha helix and there are particular hydrogen bonds between particular atoms of particular lengths and angles and, and, and so on. And MAP itself does not have that information. Therefore, it's totally crucial for refinement to employ all kinds of restraints that we may come up with from our prior knowledge about chemistry. I mentioned covalent bond, covalent geometry, bonds and angles, but also all kinds of different information, so, such as geometry of secondary structure, main chain distributions of protein chain, such as drama channel plots, side chain distributions, which are rotomers. If you happen to know that you know the structure you solve has a similar structure that was determined previously by other methods or the same method, but again, a high resolution, you may use that structure to inform refinement and actually help refinement to yield you a better refined model. So all the information you have at hand, we should use to produce a meaningful refined model. That's, that, that, that's the message and that's, that's something you need to keep in mind. Right. Um, really want to mention symmetry. I haven't mentioned symmetry just yet. Um, so real space refinement in Phoenix is aware of symmetry, of your molecular symmetry. In crystallography, we refer to NCS on crystallographic symmetry, but it's really, it's really irrelevant to cryam. So it's non-crystallographic, it's uh, whatever internal symmetry that you may call it. It's basically using the information. So if, if it happens that your molecule that you try to solve is symmetric, um, you can exploit that information in, in refinement, right? Um, using two ways, actually, using constraints and restraints. And these are two concepts that are very often, pretty much all the time, confused between each other. So um, try to clarify it in just a few words. Um, look at the example on the right. You have three molecules, one, two, and three, that are related by symmetry operators. And I borrowed this slide from the web, it's not my slide. Um, so constraints require, absolutely require, that these molecules, after being superposed, are totally identical absolutely identical. They have identical coordinates, identical B factors, identical occupancies. That's what constraints require. While restraints require that if you superpose these molecules, they are very similar, but not necessarily identical. That's the difference between constraints and restraints in this particular example. Just so you know, Phoenix real space refine can only use NCS constraints. That's the technical limitation that we have right now. All right, uh, well, that was some basic introduction what happens in the final what we have. And now I'm going to spend a few slides just talking about um, general considerations and uh, hints and tips when you do refinement. Again, this, this is just going to be a plain text that I'm going to comment on, not in particular order. Make notes and ask questions uh, if you have. And this is this is compiled based on questions, countless amount of questions we get on mailing lists and personally. So 
system uses or Phoenix uses. So hopefully that hits your question or what you think about as well. Um, yeah, so running with all defaults, so running real space requirement with all defaults is is fine most of the time. So you don't really, normally you don't really need to change any parameters. You just load in map model, you tell the resolution. And most of the time it it's just designed this way. So most of the time it just gives you the, the correct answer or improved model, should I say. Now, um, minimal required inputs, as is already said, you need to give it a model map and resolution, the map resolution. Now, many people ask how important to give a correct, exact map resolution. It's not important at all. Well, to some degree, it is important. But in fact, map, res map resolution is only used to calculate cross correlation between map and model. It does not affect the refinement progress. It does not affect the fine model. So it is important to give it if you want to get an accurate cross correlation coefficient that characterizes your map to model to map fit, but it's not going to affect um, the progress of refinement. Now, well, why do I, need, when do I need to change some default refinement settings. Um, well, that depends. And I can think of two possible scenarios. One is you run refinement and you get your model that, that you think there's something still wrong about it. And probably you suspect refinement didn't do well in this particular case. So that might be the reason to think of what you can change in the refinement settings to help. Doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And the other one, if you remember, I said morphing and simulate annealing and model identification are not, are not enabled by default. So in your refinement, none of this happen. And if you recognize that your situation is such that uh, map and model don't fit very well, so you recognize some loops need quite a bit of movement to fit the map and there are numerous instances of that, then you might want to enable morphing, simulate annealing as part of your refinement. But this is something you need to ask refinement to do. All right, so there are two situations that I can imagine. Of. I, I never seen a case where you need to change weight between restraints, for example, or between Restraints and the data term. Um, so, Pavel, look, there was a question on the chat. I don't know whether this is the right time to answer it yet. Um, the question is Would you see the same alternative confirmations for the same protein structure solved in X ray diffraction and by cryo EM at the same resolution? Um, well, I haven't done any systematic research on that. So I I would say I don't know, just to be to be to be safe. So, but I do see uh, a lot of alternative conformations in high resolution CryM data sets. So that definitely, you know, that definitely happens for CryM, and we know as uh, it's normal for for X rays. But I have never made that to. Uh, that correlation between prime and crystallography. Did that answer this question? Yeah, I think that's good. All right. Um, yeah. So just thinking of most typical situation when you have refinement at three, three point five angstrom resolution and lower. So again, this this question comes all the time, and that's why I put it in here. Yeah. Uh, so if you have your map 3, 3.5 and lower action resolution, you always use Ramachandran plot restraints, you always use secondary structure restraints. If you can use reference model restraints because that we demonstrated that helps. However, at high resolution, you use these restraints only 
and only if needed. What I mean by that, you run refinement without those restraints and you realize, wow, that's a lot of outliers, things don't go well. You try those restraints and see if that helps. If that helps, that, that's, that's something you need to use. So that's, that's, the, that's the take home message from this. Okay, well, internal symmetry LCS, that's what I uh, talked about a few slides away. Um, so how, how we handle this, how we use this in refinement. In general, uh, Phoenix Real Space Refine is set up such that it's going to um, analyze the input structure and see if there are any NCS related copies, if there's any symmetry. And if there's uh, symmetry, it will look at resolution and decide whether you want to use NCS constraints or not. However, and then that, that's the safer bet, uh, you can actually tell refinement yourself what is the symmetry and what are the uh, symmetry related copies. So you can do it manually. I'm not encouraging you to do it, but I'm saying if you do it, that could be more foolproof way of doing this rather than decide, rather than letting software to do it. So basically what you can do, you can run simple insights from PDB tool, which will annotate symmetry related copies in your model, which you can use in refinement. And that is, that is more safe way to define symmetry at this point. I should say we are working on a way to do it more automatically and hopefully we'll have a way to do it more automatically, but that's, that's, that's the uh, suggestion for now. Okay, if you have symmetrized maps, which means symmetry was used in three-dimensional reconstruction, in that case, you always use NCS constraints because there is no, there's no reason for symmetry related copies to be different because the, the data is, um, is identical for those copies. So the data wouldn't tell why they should be different. So if, you use, if, if, if your map is symmetrized, if symmetry was using the construction, then you must use symmetry in refinement. That's the bottom line. So if symmetry was not used in the construction, then it's kind of resolution dependent. So at high resolution, you are fine to not use symmetry because then, um, you know, then we find may discover differences between copies and that might, you know, explains whatever you have interesting in your structure. However, at low resolution, still, you know, if map was not symmetrized, but low resolution data is unlikely to pinpoint uh, differences between copies, local small differences between copies. So it's up to the user to de decide whether to use constraints or not, but my suggestion would be to actually use constraints in that case. Now, um, secondary structure restraints are just a type of restraints that maintains uh, um, secondary structure of your model during refinement. And as I pointed out, um, a good idea to always use a resolution three or worse, because again, MAP doesn't have that information to maintain geomet good geometry of your helices, better sheets. At resolutions better than three angstrom, as again, I pointed out, use it if needed. And you find out just, you know, running two refinement rounds with or without and see which one is better. Now, how you define secondary structure annotation? And that's the very important question here. So we're really bottom line, um, secondary structure annotation needs to be as complete and accurate as possible, exactly as I wrote here. And 
any errors in secondary structure notation are going to be implied in the model. So that's totally important. Why is this important? Because model quality can be different. Can the input model may be very, very good geometrically to begin with, or may be totally distorted. And there's no way that software can um, reliably uh, determine, infer uh, secondary structure from your model. So while it's possible that software can infer secondary structure from your model, it's much safer that you provide that information yourself. So the way to do it is to provide headaches and sheet records in PDF file. Phoenix can generate a parameter file that defines secondary structure and that you can edit. And practically, the way you do it, you run secondary structure restraints tool from the command line or there's a GUI tool to do that. You edit that information to match your best knowledge about the structure and that's your secondary structure notation. So that's totally important and this just repeats what I just said. Um, okay. Now, a um, few slides about Ramachandra plot restraints because that's equally important. Uh, similarly to secondary structure restraints, uh, you normally use it at three, 3.5 and worse. Better than three, use it if needed. So again, you run both refinements and see if refinement without Ramachana restraints gives you a meaningful result. If not, then you try to use them and see what happens. But what's totally important is never use Ramachana restraints to fit Roma channel plot outliers. So you need to fi fix them manually and then run refinement with restraints so that refinement does not produce any more outliers starting from a good structure. I'm going to all, um, illustrate this with this example. So this, this is really a um, real example from, from, from PDB. 5A9Z has to run a channel plot, calculated, uh, given original structure. And I see it and say, wow, that's a lot of outliers. And I'm lazy to fix them manually. It's a lot of pictures, right? So why don't I just run real space refinement with Roma channel plot restraints enabled and magically that refinement fixes them all? Well, it fixed them all. But if you look at the plot, the plot looks very, very strange. Yeah. So you don't have any outliers. Well, you have one, two, three, four, five outliers out of hundreds, maybe, which is good. You know, we, we think it's good. But the plot doesn't look natural to a trained eye, at least. So the plot is strange. You have some contouring around borders some systematic features in the plot, which are not really expected. So, and that, that, that prompts you to think whether this is a good idea to do it or not. Now, well, it takes um, train eye, like I said, to um, recognize the situations. So the, on the previous slide, it's really, I was trying to show that uh, using refinement to fit to fix from a channel outliers is not a good idea because really what you get is something that is very strange and I'll explain to you what it, why, why it is strange. Um, but this is a valid situation where actually using from a channel plot restraints is a good idea. Is it, it is indeed a good idea. So if you start out with something that makes sense, so everything is in the good regions and fit the map, but you know, may happen to be not of a high resolution enough. And so if you run refinement, things may go off borders after refinement. 
then looking at this, you realize, well, I need to I need to do something about it. I need to apply restraints, Ramachandran plot restraints, and that's that's the good thing to do in this particular case. Right. So the Ramachandran, the bottom line message here is Ramachandran plot restraints is something to um, keep good model good rather than fixing bad model to be hopefully good. That's 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 the idea here. Okay, well, moving forward um, towards final stages of refinement, what do you do towards final stages of refinement? Um, basically, there are three topics here, refining B factors, occupancies, and adding solvent. And unlike crystallography, again, this is something you do towards the end in case of cryam because your model doesn't fit back into the map. That's the idea. So basically you go all the way, fitting your model into the map as good as you can, as the coordinates. And once you're confident your model fits the map, as good as you manage to do it, then that's the point where you start refining B factors, you start modeling outlocks and refining occupancies and start adding water. And we have all the tools to do that right now in um, Real Space Refiner and Phoenix. So Phoenix Real Space Refine can refine group B factors as well as individual B factors. And that is new as of two weeks. We can refine occupancies as well. That's new. And it can automatically, no, actually, not, not Phoenix Real Space Refine. There's a dedicated tool that can take your model and map and place water into the map, which is called Phoenix DAOs, available in the command line on the GUI. I don't have time to go into great details, but that's the link to presentation and document as well that explains how it's done, what it does, what's the scope, and so on. So, but bottom line is you can refine individual B factors against Cryam map, you can refine occupancies and model ad logs, and you can place waters into your structure as well based on, on Cryam map. And again, important, you do it at the final stages, you don't do it from the start. First, you fit your model, you find it, make sure it's as good as possible, then do the three steps. Okay, um, well, other things to other thing to mention is um, this MMC thing, right? So as you're probably all aware of, uh, PDB is moving towards MMC effective uh, summer 2019, they switched to only accept MMCs for crystallography data. Uh, that's coming for, for CRIAM, but even now, Cryam that it says can be large enough that they can only fit into MMC. So, so you know, Phoenix has a support for input and output of MMC files. So you can input MMC files, you can output MMC files from real space refinement in particular and most of Phoenix tools. So that's not supported, but we're still working on making it a better support. And that's the, that's the paper that documents uh, this, this transition. Okay, um, pr pretty much done with refinement and I'm going to just touch on validation. I know Jane is going to talk about validation, but I'll touch on some aspects that I'm pretty sure Jane is not going to talk about. So what is validation just generally? given structures and data. It's not just model. We validate model data and how model fits the data. So every time you do validation, it's basically checking three, the model, the data, and how well model fits the data. Why I mention this is because I keep seeing this very, very poor misconception when people think of validation is just looking at the model. And never look at the data and rather look at how well model fits the data. So that's wrong. Believe me not. 
And every time you do validation, you actually do model data and model to data fit validation. Take a message from this slide. Um, why to do validation? I know it sounds banal and uh, obvious, but you know, what doing validation helps you to save time. Why? Because if you know you have low resolution map, or if you know there's training in your fair data, or you know some pathologists of your uh, data, then you can factor that in to your procedure and that definitely is going to save you time. That helps you produce better models because you, you keep eye on quality controls during the procedure. That helps you to set correct expectations. You know, if you deal with low resolution data, that's going to take you longer to get your structure they have correct expectations, helps you to minimize mistakes because you keep checking your structure. Um, big topic, I have no time to talk about it in great details, but there's a long, long paper where we documented tools in Phoenix, available to you in Phoenix that do validation of CRIM maps and models. Um, just a few slides to convince you why it's important. I know it's obvious, but um, maybe not, not, not for everyone. So uh, it's a real example from PDB where, you know, map and model fit quite well, but there's a big part of structure that just hangs around in vacuum. There's no answer, et cetera. That's something you don't want to end up depositing. Hope it's clear to everybody. Same here, there's an origin shift between map and model. So if I am as a naive user, download a PDB file and the map file, load them and look at them, they don't match. It's pretty bad. Um, you also don't want to end up depositing something that has outrageously bad geometry, like in this case, very recent published in Nature, surprisingly, right? Uh, where the class score is horrible and the geometry is just shocking, right? We, we know what's expected in this particular case. <laughs> so you don't want to do this quite obviously, but that's why it's important to do validation. And finally, before I finish with talking the slides, um, I want to, um, like to mention something that is quite important but not obvious. So as I mentioned, refinement heavily relies on validation, right? Um, we use more and more refinement, real space refine, particularly use more and more restraints like trauma channel flow restraints, better deviation, secondary structure restraints, and so on. There's all the tools that also used or used to be used in validation. And as a consequence, um, validation becomes less capable of catching these problems because we use these targets as restraints. Here's an illustration. So let's consider this example. That's a real example that was published in PNAS 2019. Um, that's the PDB code identity. So if you look at all the geometry statistics, it looks pretty perfect. So if you look at those numbers and say, wow, that's great structure, that's fantastic. There's nothing to worry about a structure based on overall metrics, right? But um, if you calculate trauma channel plot, which Phoenix real space refine real, and refine does all the time. And if you actually look at it, well, you know, is it a good plot? That's the first question comes to mind. Well, I would say it's not, but let's explore why it's not. Well, a trained eye can actually tell what is good plot or what is not good plot, what is a bad plot, right? This is an obvious example of one year zero ultra high resolution structure, perfect from a channel plot. Everything belongs to where it's expected, that's great. And that's an example I think I mentioned before, maybe a different one, but that's obviously a very bad plot. 
All right, I hope everybody agree on that one. Now, um, well, the previous example is pretty obvious, which is what, what is good versus what is not good. Now let's look at the three examples here. And is this a good plot on the left? Well, there's no outliers. Pretty much everything sits in the favorite region. Is this good a plot? Same, same deal here and same deal here. Are they good? Difficult to tell, right? So you need to have a trained eye to actually know. Well, it turns out that uh, smart people several decades ago introduced a numerical value, numerical method, just one number to calculate that could tell you, that could answer the question that I just asked, whether this Roman channel plot is good or not. And that's called Roman channel plot z-score. Right, and actually that number can give you the answer. So that is implemented in Phoenix, thanks Oleg Sobolev, as well as it's been used for ages in PDB redo and watch check. So, and there's a very clear and obvious guidance for this number. So if that number is greater than three, the magnitude of it, we know it's poor, if it's between two or three, it's suspicious. If it's less than two, it's good. I don't have time to explain why this. Check out this paper, you'll find out. But that's what it is. So now, if we look at this plot, we go back to this plot again, we calculate this Rama Z score. For the very good plot, we get a good number. We you know it's great. And for the poor plot, we get a horrible number. We know it's poor, it's way greater than three. So we can tell without looking at the plot, we can tell there's a problem. And going back to examples I showed you before, um, the Ramazet score for this one is minus five. Absolute value is minus five is five, well greater than three. It's horrible. This one is horrible. Same here and same here. So bottom line is it's great to look at plots visually, but you're not, if you're not trained, you can calculate a number that Phoenix provides you and you can use this guidance to decide what that means. Going back to that PS example that I showed you to begin with, for this one, it's minus 3.3 .3 absolute value 3.3 .3 means poor. Yeah, this is a poor plot. Okay, I don't have time to go into great details explaining how that is calculated and what's the rationale and so on. It's published in structure a year ago, two actually a year ago. Um, so you can learn more how that works, but that number is calculated for you in real space refinement and in validation tools in Phoenix. So you get, every time you do refinement, you get that number. Keep on it. Towards the end, um, just wanna mention there are a lot of resources for you to explore if you are a beginner or still learner. A lot of uh, tutorials, documentation, video tutorials, talks, like the one I'm giving right now. Not exactly the same, but there are lots of um, PDF at presentations link. So explore this side of the web page. You'll find a lot of stuff that might be helpful to you. There is a documentation specific to Cryon on Phoenix web page. So we try to make it clear the tools for crystallography and Cryon. At the bottom, we find Cryon. That's be helpful to you. Um, and the last thing to mention is, um, right, so there's a lot of resources to uh, look at and, and, and such, but clearly you might have experienced problems and uh, bugs and just have random questions. 
So there, there are ways to communicate those problems and questions to developers or to entire community of users. So you can use Phoenix mailing list, Phoenix BB, where you can send a message and ask developers as well as the entire community will get it and try to respond. If you want to remain private of, um, of the community of users, you can send your um, messages to box of help. So if you have a bug, you can just self send to box and you have questions sent to question and only Phoenix developers will get that message and we'll, we'll do our best to respond to the question. Now, uh, so you have channels to communicate problems and to usually respond to them 24 hours to, to all inquiries. Um, now, that's very important. Guidance for reporting problems or asking for help. But just telling us something didn't work and showing your frustration doesn't help. Um, it really can't help you if you don't help us to understand what your problem is. So every time you report a problem, make sure you um, first, make sure that problem doesn't exist in the latest Phoenix version. So if, if the last time you installed Phoenix was three years ago and something crashes, first thing for you to go to Phoenix webpage and install the latest nightly build of Phoenix, and then rerun your job and see if the problem still exists. If it doesn't exist, great. You're all good to go. If it does exist, then you send us all inputs, files and everything, supporting all the information parameters and such, and tell us how we can reproduce that problem, how I can, given your files, run and follow the same steps you did and possibly get the crash. And if I do get a crash, I'll fix it right away and hopefully next day you have a fixed version of Phoenix where that crash does not exist. So that's very important to keep in mind. It's totally pointless to report bugs in versions that are several years old because we're not going to look into those versions. All right, I'm done with my, with my presentation. So I'm ready to run, um, I'm ready to run tutorial which is literally going to take a few minutes. Uh, it's not um, a long tutorial, but it's up to Nigel to decide, shall we um, take questions now or shall we um, run tutorial first and then uh, take questions? Well, Paul's on, so uh, maybe he can. Uh, well, maybe you could proceed with tutorial. And then, then uh, some questions, and we do have time later on for questions, of course. Okay, uh, that sounds great. Um, I, I'm literally um, not going to run where anything anything fancy, just um, just to show how things work in general. Now let me uh, quit Phoenix, so I just start from scratch. Um, I'm going to fire up. Um, Phoenix from the command line, and depending how you installed Phoenix, it could be just clicking on an icon or typing something from the command line. So I'm having a command line version. I'm going to fire up um, Phoenix tutorial, and I'm sure Tom showed you last time how to set up tutorial data. I'm going to do the new project. I am going to um, set up tutorial data. I'm also going to define where the data is going to be placed. I'm just choosing the folder that I would like to use for this. And you choose whatever you like. And then I then I choose actual tutorial data. So down below, for cry am, there's a lot of tutorials here, which refer to model building, dance modification, and, and, and so on. And towards the bottom of that, there are a couple of doing refinement. So I'll choose just one. So there's MomK, double helical filament, 
that's the rule space defined that, that tells you what it exercises. So I click on that one. Actually, you can read the readme file, which explains the objective of this tutorial that gives you an information about what is what. So some information here and also provides where the files came from. All right, um, so let's load that tutorial in. And before we actually run refinement, let's see what's our starting point. Let's do validation. Let's actually do what I just told you. Uh, let's validate your structure and data using tools we have. So we can go to either CryM and there's comprehensive validation CryM. You can also go to validation and there is comprehensive validation CryM, which are the same thing. These are just addresses. Doesn't matter which one you choose. Um, that pops up a standard window where you prompt to loading um, map and model files. In case of CRIAM, most of the time you load these files, you also need to specify what the resolution is. We can infer the resolution from the map, but if you know the number, that's more that's that's most accurate. In this case, from memory, I think it is 3.6. You define scattering table, which is electron all the time for, for CRIAM. You say run. will take uh, under a minute or less. Oh. Prints a lot of information, but uh, in the end, it gives you what we call table one for CRIM. Um, and this is something I mentioned in, in, in my, my, my slides. So basically this information is broken down into two, into three sections. The information about the model data and how well the model fits the data. And since this is kind of table one summary, you get you don't get any local information, you get just global numbers. So let's you can also fire up CUDE to see map and model in CUDE, and that's interactive with respect to this table. Um, so Table is color coded, color co coded in, in a way that uh, anything that is not colored is fine, just for information. Um, but anything that is red is worrying, needs your attention, essentially. And I think you can have instances of um, yellow, which is a warning, but may not necessarily be a problem. And in this particular case, you have a lot of problems here, which is quite obvious looking at the model as well. You have terrible amount of clashes, which are you know, highlighted by probe dots. A lot of stuff going on here. So great. Uh, you got, um, let's just pick one. It's 3.6, as I mentioned. So the, the bond and angle deviations are outrageous for this resolution. You don't expect that. That's too bad. You don't expect so many outliers on Roma channel plot again at this resolution. Um, round of that score, if you remember, 4.5, it means poor, terrible. And actually, all this is clickable. You can click on this one. Is it clickable? Hmm, no. Well, you can go to mall property and Ramachandran plot, I'll see the plots. Well, why they look ugly, but um, you can switch to one plot and you'll see um, you have outliers in the structure. Well, the rest quite quite fine, but uh, may not be follow the follow distribution why you get um, the death score is not great. 
So the idea here is you basically go from, from metric to metric and uh, look what you can improve. And you pay particular attention at something that's um, that is outrageously um, outstanding, such as you know Rotterdam outliers. You click. You have in this particular case you have more than ten percent of Rotterdam outliers, while they expect zero at three point six. So you click on them and. You literally need to fix them. There is a table. So if you go work your way through that table, you can click on particular outlier and as okay, focused and cute, and you look at each one and see if you can fix them. Again, we don't have time to go this in great details, but that's the idea. So you click on the problem, highlight it in the table one, that will bring you to the table, which is a detailed enumeration of problems. And then you go one by one and see if and how you can fix them. That's the idea, that's the general idea. All right, um, let's quickly do uh, refinement. So again, you can go to refinement and also real space refinement. Under refinement top, or you can go to CRIM and also see real space refinement. Both are identical, just analysis. I'll close down cute. So running refinement is as simple as running validation. Again, you got a generic uh, window where you're prompted to load files. And for refinement, if you remember, you need to load map and model. So that's the model, that's the map. You need to tell the resolution. Again, the resolution is used only for reporting statistics. It does not, it, it is not used for factual calculations that changes your model. Not this is 3.6. It's a good idea to give it a job title because that gives the title of your refinement effort today, just in case you come back and wonder what you did months ago. We have some name, but you might come up with a better idea. Um, going to refinement settings, by default, as I mentioned, we'll be refining uh, coordinates, occupancy, do Rotomer searches and defactors. As I mentioned before, you don't want to do occupancy refinement and defactor refinement all the time, only do it towards the end. It does not harm to do it all the time, it will just waste your time. So do it towards the end. That's why I checked these two uh, boxes. Um, what else is important? Microcycles, the more you do, the better chances your model converges to the stable local minimum. However, you don't have to do it if you just change one residue in your structure and just try to see how that fits. So five is fine default, but if you make small changes to your model, maybe three or two is enough. If you do a lot of rebuilding, then five or greater might be the thing to do. Um, if you have more than one CPU use in your machine, you just tell it. I have eight, so I say eight. Um, so the Rama channel restraints are always enabled, but as I said, at high resolution, you may want to disable it, and at low resolution, you always need to have it. Phoenix real space refine will decide whether to use symmetry of your molecule or not, right? Um, so that's the default. You, by, by, by this, you let the program define it. You can check it or uncheck it. That's, that's your choice. Um, but besides, everything is fine. So I'll check changes to um, three macro cycles just for the sake of time and run it real quick. It typically takes, I mean, it depends on your structure, but it never takes more than, well, for huge structures, it may take an hour to run it on one CPU, as far as my experience shows me, but typically it takes 
minutes, several minutes, tens of minutes, depends on the structure, but uh, it's supposed to be quick, especially if you use um, multiprocessing. And multiprocessing is can, can explore uh, symmetry. So if you have strict symmetry in a structure, then um, refinement will work only on symmetry independent part of the structure and imply all the changes to symmetry related parts of the structure. So that's why we save a lot of time and actually do the right thing because you don't expect symmetry, you don't expect differences between symmetry copies. But yeah, on the second macro cycle, so it's almost finished. And what we see here got printed into the log file. Normally, you don't need to look into this log file, but sometimes it's helpful if you understand all the numbers and uh, stuff here, then you can actually read it and see what was the Rama Z score in the beginning compared to Rama Z score towards the end. So things like that are printed out here and are available to you to, to look at. We're almost done here. And probably notice the Rama Z dropped down from nine, minus four to point six. That means from terrible to good, it's a good sign. But that's something I notice on passing just looking at the, uh, the log file. Of course, you can have a look at log file at your leisure. All clickable and available to you. Okay, it's all done. So you can open and cute. Um, you can go to validation section right away and Quick thing to observe, we have less red here, which is great. So we managed to improve structure eventually. We got for Ramachara plot, we got from zero outliers. Remember for the rotom outliers, we, we started out with 10 or 11. Now we have zero. It's also good. Um, those red ones, that's something you need to click and investigate. But again, uh, just for free running it uh, with all defaults and totally automatically we clean out our structure quite a lot. If you look on graphics, there's no free lunch, of course, and there are still um, clashes and such. So the recipe here would be to, um, well, there are two things. One is to rerun refining adding hydrogens. So this model doesn't have contain hydrogens. And that means, you know, atoms are not aware that hydrogens are actually present in, the, in, in, in reality. So adding hydrogens is going to help these clashes pretty much for sure. And of course, the other thing you still need to go and check things manually and fit and repeat things and um, improve your model geometrically and with respect to the map. So, but that's the, that's the idea, that's the idea. But um, these tools allow you to actually do this interactively. So you can click on fields that are on red and you can see what is outlier and try to understand why it is outlier. There's no rotom outliers. Rama channel plot now looks all fine. Looks more natural to me at least. Okay, well, I hope I um, conveyed you the idea what refinement is and how you run it and what you pay attention to. Um, I guess I, I'm over time by large margin now, so I guess I stop at this point and I'm happy to take your, your questions. I stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you. So there are some questions in the chat, which we can go through. Um, uh, so Jonathan had asked a question about whether the PDB sets limits for how, for, I don't know, accepting structures. And Oleg pointed out that that's not their job. 
if, if things are published um, or even if they're not published actually uh, uh, you don't have to have a paper to deposit a structure in the pdb uh, they, they aren't the police the, the, they will tell you that there are all these problems with your structure but they expect you to fix that and if you choose not to they they, they kind of have to accept your structure unfortunately uh, there's a more co a complex question from Alexander. I have a cryon density of a dimer at 2.8 angstrom. To improve the density of one of the domains, I have to partially subtract signal to create a monomer and split into two to three rigid bodies. So I guess you're doing a focused refinement, focused reconstruction. Then you can build all the domains. You can now create a composite map and do refinement against the whole structure. Is that a good strategy? So uh, I guess the, I guess your question is whether it's good to do refinement against separate reconstructions for parts of the molecule that all, have all been stitched together, and there are tools in Phoenix to put the things together. Uh, so I'm not sure if we have a particular answer to that question because I'm not sure we have enough experience. I don't know what your experience so far is, Pavel. No, um, uh, yeah, I, we, we don't. I totally agree. We don't have a particular experience on, on, on this matter. So, um, yeah, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I think the the challenge um, is that the the places where you where the 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 individual domains sort of. Uh, intersect where, so where you've done the reconstructions and the piece the, the bits where they overlap it's not clear whether those will be completely physical uh, when tom talked about the tools for doing that um superposition of different uh, focus reconstructions he did say that they're weighted in such a way that the the, the better looking bits will be will be better <laughs> and more clear uh so it's still not quite clear whether they will but whether they will be completely chemically meaningful uh, from a structural point of view and so also, we need to get more experience right and also since we can do refined b factors it's not clear what refined b factors are going to mean if you have this um, mosaic of different maps somehow normalized and sharpened or filtered whatever um so i think that's still an open question just in general Yes, I mean, hopefully this will become clearer, but I don't think it's a bad approach. What you what you asked about, Alexander, but uh, I think you need to pay attention to the bits of the model that that are where the reconstructed domains meet to make sure that they sort of make sense. I would There's think a... that they almost have to not make sense some of the time, at least, but you would get better structures. Uh, I don't know. I mean, you already have re refined against the focused map. And so in the focused map, you've already got as good a structure as you can get. Uh, and I think you may even have to do another focus if you really care about one region, like in a ribosome, if you do uh, the two big halves, then if you have trnas the trnas will look weird and so if you really care about them you'd have to do another focus on them almost yes so i i, I think there are a lot of open questions at <laughs> this point of it, but no i don't have the right experience either i'm just yeah it, it definitely that. Uh, I, I think maybe some experimentation see which which gives you the best answer but uh yeah it's a probably a longer discussion about what what should actually be used to convey information about the structure to the world as well i mean clearly if you've got one domain that is that if you have to do focus re re refinements it means that you've got flexibility in your in your model in your complex in some way and so just showing the world a, a snapshot of one sort of confirmation that you put together is could be misleading as well. So that's a whole other, other issue <laughs> beyond actually what gives you the best answer. Um, there's a question from Tapan. Is there a way to check 
if the scale of a map, uh, so that this is to do with the scale of the error in the pixel value is accurate, and if so, how to fix, so what, how, how to deal with the scale of the map not being quite right, and could a minor error create major problems for refinement in, in the sort of two and a half to four angstrom range? Yeah, um, I, as, as you pull now, I spent a lot of time trying to figure it out. And turns out in, in the current state of the art, at least the way Phoenix real space design works, the scale of the map, I guess we're talking about magnification, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it doesn't really matter, surprisingly. So despite all the bars and publications that it does matter, but the way we are set up, I'm yet to see a case where it does matter. So if, by the way, that's the open question to the community. If anyone has a case where it does matter, feel free to contact me and illustrate that case. I'll be gladly take it and look and investigate. So, but myself so far, I've never seen a case where scale of the map, the magnification offset actually does affect the refinement. So I've never seen that in my experience. Again, I know there are documented cases where it does make difference, but I've never been able to reproduce that and see it for myself. That's my that's my that's my experience. Yeah, it, it's certainly possible that the magnification could have an impact on model building uh, when you're trying to sort of match patterns, and if if the scale is wrong, significantly wrong, uh, it it could. Well, actually, if it was a very big volume, it wouldn't have to be that wrong, actually, but uh, it, it could cause issues. Uh, yeah. I, think the, the, I guess the, 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 the scale errors that are typical these days are not as large as they have been in the past, although they're still there, I think. Yeah, I mean, my, my speculation on this would be um, the way we set up with refinement, we rely heavily on restraints and the map is just a guide, while restraints is something that is pretty much guide given, and um, you can't screw your model just by fitting into the wrong map. So you'll always get a chemically correct model, no matter what kind of map you have. So the question is then um, whether whether it fits the best possible map, and given the scale offset, it might not be fitting the best possible map, which is which is unfortunate, but it's very hard to detect. So that's, that's, that's my speculation. Yes, I mean, clearly if your scale factor is off by 50%, you've got a problem, but um, I think you've probably got bigger problems if, if, if that's happening in your reconstruction. Uh, so this, uh, I guess Alex said he'd like to profit from density modification in Phoenix. Uh, that's a good idea. So the, um, the tools are there and worth trying. Uh, definitely a possibility can improve things. Absolutely. Uh, 